morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you are. Make yourself comfortable, remove your mask in front of your PC, and have a cup of coffee or beer if you're in Australia or Asia. Uh, great to be with you, Melanie, and thank you, Lausanne, for hosting this uh, wonderful event in uh, challenging times. So this afternoon, we'll, uh, we'll kind of look under the bonnet and look at some very concrete examples of how cities are uh, bringing the SDGs into action, so to say. We had some overview this morning of, of what these SDGs are, and I'll get back to different ways or, or forms of presenting that format and bringing them into action with a few trends in different parts of the world um, that are showing how sports, physical activity for all, an active game, active play can really improve uh, the situation of, of many. Um, so we'll, uh, we'll start with uh, a little bit of a reminder. This is not a crash course into the SDGs, but uh, all of you are pretty much familiar uh, with these 17 SDGs. Although I have to say that I'm still surprised many times by the lack of understanding of these SDGs. It's only a few years uh, old. And a lot of people don't necessarily get the systemic approach of these SDGs and they don't really know where to start. I mean, quite naturally, some people might start from one and go to two and three, or they might start with 17 because you can't do much alone. You need to be in alliance and work together. But in all cases, once you act on, on one of these SDGs, all of them kind of uh, change. Keep in mind also that behind these SDGs, there's a number of targets that have been set by the UN and a number of indicators that are here available for people to help them on their journey. Um, but nevertheless, as we are here gathered because of sports, um, I challenge you to look uh, and find sports on these 17 SDGs. So uh, we kind of agree this afternoon to use SDG 18, uh, physical activity and, and sports for all, because that's really the core of the message. How does it connect to a number of these SDGs and how can we bring that into action? Before the SDGs were uh, launched a couple of years ago, the uh, UN General Assembly had already recognized uh, the powerful uh, role of sports uh, to contribute to health, development, and, and peace policies around the world. Um, there was this particular reference here saying that sport is an enabler to the SDGs. Um, it's a powerful enabler, um, and, and we need to, to continue very hard on, on the advocacy to position sport as best as we, we can. But when cities are trying to adopt this SDG framework or government, national governments, okay, where, the question remains, where do we actually start? And, and it's all good um, to, to project these SDGs on the Parliament House, as we did in Bern recently, uh, but it's not going to change the lives of, of people. And, and we do believe that the lives of people change at a very local level. It, it does uh, change at the school level, in the neighborhood, in the local parks, in the workplace. So we're going to look at some of these examples through a setting-based approach in, in the coming slides. The bad news is we are late because we're kind of entering now the 10 year of action and, and Secretary General of the UN said last year in a, in a sort of uh, assessment, um, there's a lot that remains to be done. We must step up our efforts. And the question is really how could sport and physical activity contribute as a catalyst, as an accelerator in that 10 years of action? Um, Let's look at different ways of, of, of uh, leveraging the SDGs. We'll hear tomorrow morning, please join us, wonderful session on health. We will have Fiona Bull from World Health Organization, who is kind of the owner of this global action uh, plan on physical activity that uh, WHO uh, issued in June 2018. Interestingly, in their approach, they recognize the connection between sports, physical activity, and 13 of the SDGs. So it, it's, it's quite enormous, uh, and the number of opportunities are, are massive in terms of how you connect sports with these different uh, targets. The UNESCO has been working really hard on the Kazan Action Plan over the last few years. They are engaging with the ministers of sports and physical activity, physical education around the world. They're focusing on five key actions. They're connecting with at least eight of the SDGs. Um, lots of work going on in this direction. I'd like to also use this, um, this Youth Strategy 2030 that was published also a couple of years after the SDGs came out, simply because this is the next session. We'll talk about youth, but I want to make a point on the importance of giving youth a seat around the decision table, because whatever we discuss for 2030 or beyond is really for them, and it should not be just for them, but with them in terms of engaging and empowering some of the leaders in the youth communities. Another framework and an approach that I like um, that was recently published through a partnership between UN Habitat and the World Health Organization is a look at how to integrate health considerations in urban planning. And of course, we're talking to cities mostly today, so 
I believe this model here is quite interesting because it's putting number 11, sustainable cities and communities, and number three, uh, health and well-being uh, at the center stage, really. So these are some of, of, the, of the different frames we can use, but keep in mind also that we need to understand where we start from. So what is the baseline? What are our main challenges? What are the priorities in terms of challenges we face? Uh, is it about pollution? Is it about social deprivation? Is it about uh, em employability and access to decent jobs? So depending on your analysis and, and your starting base, you can set some, some objectives and you should use some indicators. And there's a lot of work going on right now in these fields, especially from uh, the Commonwealth Secretary area, which is working also with UNESCO, with the IOC, with the Japan Sports Council, and they're doing a fantastic job to come up with indicators to help governments, cities, uh, implement these SDGs and, and monitor uh, strictly where they are and how they move forward. One model that I have developed and published recently that I wanted to share with you to concretely show how sports for development, not only in uh, developing countries and looking at youth, because that was the focus, but actually the model here is applicable anywhere. But if you use and leverage sports as a development tool and you look at active living, active learning, active playing for kids, active commuting as well uh, in cities, active working, active workplace, you, you realize that you can contribute to a massive number of, of elements in the, EV, in the EV individual and collective lives of, of people. It can be physical health, mental health, social health, social inclusion, uh, gender equality, uh, crime rates, uh, etc., etc. I say can, because of course, the key is to have a proper design of the sports interventions. In some cases, poorly designed interventions based on sport can reinforce stereotypes and challenges that we have in the communities. And sadly, we know of some of the cancers in sports, of course. So we need to work with the best models, the best people, the best evidence from, from, the, from, uh, from, uh, from out there to make sure that all these different benefits contribute ultimately to some of the SDGs. In that piece of work where we connected sports for development and innovative finance, we interviewed more than 40 uh, and, and NGOs active in sports for development, and clearly the six SDGs that come out strongly as benefiting most from sports and, and physical activity are these six, and I would add number 17, partnership, which is always at the heart of what we can set up uh, moving forward. It's not exclusive, of course, you can use other SDGs, but these are the main ones, and clearly the impact is to give a better prospect in life for vulnerable kids and to have stronger, more resilient, uh, more productive communities, and ultimately the question is how can we leverage on the business community, and Tom will talk about this specific aspect which is very often undermined, under scrutinized, but we need to bring business on board as well and to show the benefit not just for people and planet, but for the pro prosperity, sustainable prosperity of our communities. Now, uh, let's look at some particular countries or cities, and I, I will not stay on that slide for too long because it's just a teaser for what Celia will say in a second. But Norway is actually right now uh, at the forefront of testing one of the UN's uh, tools with 92 indicators, I believe, which is a really great compass to understand where you are, how fast you move forward, where are your weaknesses and strengths. So a lot of different tools exist out there to help governance and cities uh, move forward. There's also a, a couple of interesting con uh, concepts that are coming up. One is being developed by Professor Moreno in La Sorbonne in Paris. It's called the 15-minute uh, city. It's being tested in Paris. Uh, the mayor has been recently re-elected and she's taken very courageous decisions to get rid of, of cars in some of the streets, to, uh, to redesign streets. Uh, it's being tested in Milano, in Australia, and different parts of, of the world. It's basically about bringing more proximity between where you live, where you work, where you go for your leisure activities, and therefore being more respectful of the quality of life and of our environment and, and, and its limitations. So some uh, cityscapes are really changing quite fast. Uh, I was quite impressed uh, last time I visited Paris, at least some, of the, some parts of the city. Um, I'd like to mention also that quite innovative approach, the donut approach in Amsterdam. It's very much looking at a circular economy approach. Uh, um, and, and pushing for the awareness about the limitations in terms of the environment and, and the social well-being of, uh, of everyone. Uh, so I encourage you to look at these models. And many of you who are used to the, global, uh, to the, um, to the Smart Citizen Sports Summit have heard already about the Global Active City approach. I have been uh, luckily uh, in, in, involved in the development over the last seven, eight years, and we were lucky to um, certify 
the first six cities in 2018, and Lausanne joined last December, just in time before the Youth Olympic Games. And this, in a nutshell, is just a great model that is ISO compatible and helping cities to address the governance of, of, of the cityscape by using sports physical activity and bringing together different departments and different groups in the city, which usually don't necessarily collaborate. And uh, it's also engaging the local university and, and pushing for indicators and, and tracking. Um, let me move uh, now to this important question of, of why is it important uh, for people to be more active? Well, someone said one day in your country, I believe, uh, Tom, is the economy stupid? Because there's more and more studies coming out showing that it makes sense to get people more active from an economic point of view. Um, several studies have pointed out that one dollar, one pound invested in physical activity and sports has a return on investment of at least three or four or more, depending on the type of activity. So we're talking billions in the economy that we can save by simply having uh, a positive uh, impact on the cost of public health, for example, on the productivity of people and absenteeism and that kind of stuff. Um, there's a growing burden of sedentarism. We all know the cost of chronic disease burgeoning uh, everywhere. What the current crisis has revealed is that uh, the more chronic disease, the more sedentarism you have in your society, the more likely you are, you are to have a lot of people hit by COVID. We have an over-representation of people with uh, chronic disease, obesity, diabetes in hospital beds right now. So this is an important consideration for public leaders, city leaders, to anticipate the next crisis and to build up the resistance and the resilience of our communities because the benefits are so enormous, including in such a crisis situation. Uh, recent studies have shown clearly the link between the fitness level of people and the likelihood of ending up in hospitals. Uh, very interesting studies. It's, it's very new and fresh, so we will, of course, we'll need more months to digest all of these, all of these data. Uh, another challenge for a lot of cities that every city is sharing is air pollution. Uh, we're talking about more than a million people who have sadly died of COVID, but every year we have a silent death of more than 4 million people because of air pollution in cities. Now, pushing for physical activity and sports and more uh, softer, sustainable mobility solutions in cities can actually address also this, uh, this, this, this uh, uh, challenge. It's, it's cost, it costs um, uh, governments uh, several points on their GDP, so it's an important consideration. Looking at some of the trends now, uh, briefly, I'm going to say a few words on active design, human-centered design, uh, tactical urbanism, which are all these trends we see popping up everywhere in the world. And actually, some of these trends have gained attention and momentum because of COVID. You have all seen a number of, of, uh, of, of bicycle tracks that popped up in our cities. It was supposed to be temporary. Now, in many cities, it, it remains. We have many interesting cases in, in Lausanne. So just a few words on these trends, because I think this is where we're going and probably at a faster pace than we expected. There's, there's a move to kind of repossess some rundown areas in, in the neighborhoods and to really bring people around, uh, uh, around the originally designed uh, sports grounds. Even uh, brands like Nike Bottom Right has just uh, redesigned and launched a, uh, an active uh, park in, in Tokyo here. Uh, so there's a, there's a lot of moves and evolutions in this environment right now in rethinking the cityscape and, and, and bringing people down in the streets and literally in the streets. That is moving cars away, taking some of the parking slots, putting some of these little parklets. These are examples mostly from uh, Vancouver. And you have a couple of other examples here, including Lausanne, top right and bottom left, where one of the main streets by the lake in front of the Olympic Museum was closed. Uh, uh, on a regular basis uh, over the summer months to let people really enjoy uh, 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 physical activity, sports and movement down there with different clubs invited also to provide uh, activities for families. Very interesting trend and it's really time to move away from this car-centric design that we have inherited for decades. And when we talk about this, people look at uh, uh, Holland and, and Denmark, of course. Uh, and, and Denmark, I, I took a few days uh, on the field trip last year to Copenhagen. It was a long dream of mine and, and I don't regret it because it's really impressive what they have achieved over a few years. Moving from the question of how many cars can we move down the street to how many people can we move down the streets and really shifting the priorities in uh, cities. But it's, it's not done you know, in, in a year or two. It, it was a long process, uh, of course, and it was also a test and trial approach where they didn't get it right in the first place, but they, they took the risk uh, to, to test new things, new ways, 
and to adapt uh, all, the, all along the way. Interestingly, these trends are now spreading in my country, in the, in the biggest city in Switzerland, in, uh, in Zurich. We had a, a recent public vote uh, with a huge majority uh, deciding to block cars from 50 kilometers of streets across Zurich. So a very interesting and fast evolution. The UN have uh, definitely spotted bicycles as being one of the key weapons to uh, get people more active and healthy in cities. And this is not science fiction. Uh, this is uh, in, in, uh, in the Netherlands, uh, a, a bicycle uh, public park um, uh, for commuters with thousands of, of, of spots. A very impressive way of, of imagining our futures and giving some inspiration. Moving on uh, quickly to a couple of other settings or places where we need to really think differently, playgrounds, schools. Uh, more than 80% of, of, of youth and teenagers in the world do not reach the recommendations of, of average daily physical activity by WHO. There's an urgency to invest in more active people it's, and kids, especially now because we have studies showing that the, the COVID, the pandemic, is, 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 is putting a break to the promotion of physical activity towards uh, youth. And, and we'll hear more tomorrow in, the, in tomorrow morning session. Um, examples here from schools in Japan, in the Netherlands, to really um, think about education differently. And by the way, we have more and more studies showing that active kids learn better. So the academic results and the employability of kids and the creativity of kids is improved by having them more physically active on a regular basis. Very important to consider that across uh, the cityscape. And in terms of designing cities and designing buildings, look at these examples from Holland again. It's the rooftop of a building where they've, they've, they've put a, a playground for different generations, urban workout, kids playing, um, and, and that's a totally different way of, of looking at the cityscape. So very encouraging, very inspiring, and a couple of reminders uh, are showing us how important it is, even in this time of pandemics, to find ways to keep our kids active for their development, for their interaction with their peers, um, and, and, and not to invite them to a square, to a park, and put all these signs, do not bring a board, do not make too much noise. We, we need to really um, uh, rethink the way we can, we can uh, uh, um, uh, leverage the different spots in the city to get kids active. And moving, uh, moving on to the conclusion, a couple of other important places. Of course, we sadly spend a lot of time in the workplace, maybe less now uh, with distance working, but the workplace is an important place to also promote physical activity. There's very concrete benefits. Just a couple of numbers here from Liverpool. We'll hear tomorrow morning from Liverpool. They've had a, a, a citywide campaign to get uh, employees more active and some solid research on return on investment uh, in terms of absenteeism, in terms of better morale at work, more collaboration, etc. Very impressive results as well. Um, the clubs, the sports clubs is another place where we can rethink the way we not only introduce kids to sports and we push for competition, but in the way we can embrace different sections and pockets of population that are too sedentary. Uh, obese people, disabled people, elderly. So there's a, a whole move right now um, and a great project uh, born out of Finland, supported by European funding and tested in a couple of countries, including Ireland, where uh, they've looked at repositioning the sports club as a member of this City Health Alliance and being more inclusive and more open. And, and, and they've published all of these different benefits from a physical health, mental health, and social health. Again, if you look at this from a public policy making, you would think, okay, well, I'm going to support my local clubs if they kind of open their doors also to more practice and, and more diversified um, uh, population. Uh, Melanie is, is, is watching me and, and thinking, wait, he's got probably hours of presentation to go on. No, that's my last slide. <laughs> I just want to conclude this uh, with a bit of a model on, on a setting-based approach, really, because as, as city leaders, you should, of course, think about the big picture of these international frameworks, the SDGs, the Agenda 2030, very important reference pieces uh, to help you, guide you, and, and also in terms of reporting. So that's the macro level. And, and very often now at, at a national level, you have also national policies looking at 2030, I would say at the meso level between national and city level. But behavioral change happens at a city and local neighborhood level at, at the workplace, at the club, etc. So you have to look at the micro level, at all these different settings, and understand how you can act, how you can influence people's behaviors. Uh, again, leaning on the framework, uh, but making it very concrete locally and finding the right 
um, um, ambassadors, the right relays, and the right intervention models. And lastly, uh, an observation over years of collaboration with cities in different parts of the world. We have now a lot of people, a lot of designers, a lot of urban planners and architects who are doing great design, great places with fantastic equipment. Sometimes they forget to think about people, programs, experiences. So that's why I'm insisting on human-centered design, We're really engaging with the local population to design proper places with proper equipments. But even then, sometimes we miss the third part, which is really the promotion, the communication, the engagement, having programs and brands for people to be proud of being in an active city. So that sort of summarizes my approach um, and, and field work over the years. Um, I kind of invite you as a conclusion to use this SDG 18 if you, if you believe in it, but in all cases to kind of reboot or redesign your city with uh, the idea of getting everyone active at uh, center stage. Thank you very much.